Okay, hold on me. Here we go. I'm all good now. <laughs> That's all right. Well, thanks for um, having me over here in Saskatoon. Um, yes, as Gary was saying, uh, last, uh, last IRCP for those that um, came to Melbourne, um, discussed some of the potential ways that we could reinvent the way we could look at simulation, virtual technologies and things like that um, to help develop and change the way that we approach paramedical education. So um, a little bit about um, me and the degree that um, we're doing at the moment. Um, I've been um, in ambulance now for uh, 20 years, this is my 20th year. Um, over the past 20 years I've completed a few things to sort of redevelop the way that um, manage staff, work within education and develop other avenues like that. I'm an advanced care paramedic, uh, still work casually with the Queensland Ambulance Service but now full time with Griffith University in their School of Medicine which is based down on the Gold Coast. So um, for any of you that might be going to the Commonwealth Games in 2018, Griffith is one of the major sponsors associated with uh, the 2018 Games and many of our paramedic students that uh, we've got within this first cohort will actually be part of the uh, medical team that will be wandering around the Olympic Game, uh, the Commonwealth Games Village and other avenues like that, which is um, quite a big opportunity for them that they can add into their resumes for when they apply for their jobs. Uh, research interests, obviously um, simulation is my key area, um, but we've also got a bit of a, uh, another research in, um, in CPR uh, community-based CPR, increasing knowledge and things like that within our actual Gold Coast area. So um, maybe with the next IRCP we might um, bring the other associate professor associated with that in to talk about ways that they've improved some of those within our um, university-based hospital. The actual uh, Bachelor of Paramedicine, I'm actually quite excited about Sunday's um, international um, discussion that we're going to have because uh, our degree in Australia is actually the newest paramedic degree um, that is currently uh, in place. Uh, we have a two and a half year accelerated program. Uh, we have CAP students um, and there is another degree uh, in Australia, they're in La Trobe, I believe uh, Peter is here as well. Um, he has CAP student numbers as well. Uh, sort of we're focused on smaller numbers to deliver a uh, more intense program um, to develop a, a higher level of understanding and skill for the students that go through. My personal view is trying to push through 200 students at a time doesn't produce the quality that you're looking for with your applicants when they graduate. Our tutorial sizes alone are 8 to 10 students per tutorial group compared to some of the larger universities that push through up to 30 students. So what we can achieve in those 8 to 10 students, particularly with the technology I'm going to talk about today, is very hard to try and replicate when you've got large numbers of people that you're trying to push through. Uh, we have uh, multiple areas of placement, not just with paramedicine. Uh, we also, because we're linked with a university hospital, we have the ability to actually provide hands-on training like we used to receive when I went through 20 years ago in um, emergency rooms, a theatre, day surgery, putting LMAs and tubes in real patients, cannulating real patients, learning how to communicate with real patients, not these dummies. So providing a nice, rounded, a um, lot of experience before they actually get started on the road um, in paramedic world. And um, we also have some exclusion points. Um, so our, what that means is that throughout the degree, if they fail to achieve certain key indicators, uh, then they'll be excluded from the degree. So if they fail their paramedical placement um, or they fail the communication course that we run, which is a medical school level communication course, the students will actually be First, they can appeal, obviously, but if they fail that appeal, they'll actually be excluded from that degree. Uh, feedback that we have got from industry is that when students don't do well in certain areas, particularly on placement, be it wrong attitude, haven't got a clue what they're doing, um, industry thought, well, that's all right, we'll just pass them because they come to placement and the university can sort them out. Unfortunately, in a university setting, um, we work on how students go academically. So if students are passing academically, we have to push them through. Now, as a working paramedic, um, I always look at the person I'm, I'm working with or assessing, would I have them treat me or treat my family? So pushing back to industry, we've sort of gone through the approach, if, if you don't think they're suitable, let us know. Because giving them back to us and saying they're suitable if they're not, doesn't help the cause for when they graduate. So it's sort of a different approach that we've taken with our students. The other key point from an Australian perspective is we actually graduate in the mid-year. So most of the other degrees graduate at the end of the year. Um, and what we've found in industry is most of the vacancies happen in the middle of the year. Now, with, there's quite a few thousand um, ambulance graduates that come out every year now. 
Um, so if you graduate in that big cohort group that comes out at the end of every year, chances of employment aren't as high as if you graduate in the middle of the year when there's more opportunities um, and less people going for them. Okay, so challenges. Well, over the years I worked within education as well within Queensland Ambulance and we looked at different ways we could approach simulation. One technique that we tried, um, I worked at uh, one of the big training centres in Queensland and we had areas where we um, would look at utilising an ambulance. We had that set up with various cameras and things inside of it which we could reverse into an emergency department and then that scenario could then transfer over to medical students, nursing students to do their assessment and then move on from there. And we thought that was quite good, but it was very time consuming um, and very costly uh, and particularly trying to make everyone link up together. So we looked at ways that we could actually get that environment um, more sort of closely related to how they operate when they're on road. So it's, it's all very well sitting in a classroom, having a stretcher that's sort of attached to a table. You practice pulling it in and out and practice doing different um, observations and things like that. But what's it like actually applying your base level um, techniques or your advanced techniques in those confined environments? How do you readjust yourself when you're trying to actually do um, cannulation and the only arm you can get to is actually the one that's pinned to the side of the ambulance? Or how do you do CPR in a moving vehicle? Um, retrieval services, for example, and this is where we're working closely with our, our ho university hospital across the road. Um, nurses and doctors, they do a fabulous job in in what they're actually doing in resuscitation and trauma rooms and things like that. But what about if we take them and throw them in the back of an ambulance? Okay, now do the same technique that you would do in a very big resuscitation room. And now you've got this tiny little three metre by two metre space. I'm not sure what that is in feet terms, sorry. Um, and see how they respond with that. And not only have they got that tiny space, they've got a chair that's in the way. They've got a, they've got a the other aspects that just, it's, it's not the same. Okay, so this type of ability actually works quite well. And that's the modular design, which is great. Okay? You've got a modular design, it represents the space and things like that. But how do you actually then change from modular to actually movement? Um, and that's where this particular technology has come in. Not only have we we've taken that modular design, but we've set it up in such a way that it will actually make it feel like you're moving. So far in the initial tests and trials that we've done, we haven't actually got motion, official motion, like you have in an aircraft simulator. That's next. Um, but just in the static um, section, which actually has the motion emulated around you, we've had multiple people reaching for emesis bags and multiple people have thrown up. Um, someone said to me earlier this week, how do you, you probably need to replicate some smell and other things like that. Well, we haven't needed to yet because people have automatically done that themselves. So for those of you who have ever had a patient throw up on top of you in an ambulance or you've had that experience, we have to put up with that for the rest of the trip, um, you understand what I mean. Um, and I mean, learning experiences of that personally. Um, I remember giving activated charcoal to someone that had taken a, a bucket load of paracetamol. Um, and I had myself seat belted into the uh, patient care chair. Well, I'll never do that again in dealing with those patients because I wore the charcoal because I couldn't undo my seat belt quick enough. Okay, so how did we get from that to where we are? So initially we went into module design. So this room is actually the first room other than the uh, engineers that helped me construct this at Griffith University that have seen these schematics. So it went with me going into an ambulance, measuring it up, looking at the various aspects of how we can actually look at this to actually be put forward. So as you can see, we've got our side cabinetry, our windows, top down view with a stretcher chair and things like that. Now the reason I went into so much detail is the people I was working with at the university, none of them, oh, other than one that actually got admitted um, for falling off his ladder doing some repairs in his house, had ever spent any time inside an ambulance. So they had no idea about the complexity, the space, the sizing and things like that. And then from there, we went into the construction phase. And as you can see, we've got our, we've got our cabinetry. The lights make it a bit hard to see, but we've got our cabinetry. You can see that there's um, actual the windows um, associated here. It's not actually a window, it's actually a projection screen. Okay, so we have them set up around the ambulance and you'll understand why that's important a little bit later on. And then from that phase, we went into the actual construction of actually making it function like an ambulance. Again, most people just have a module and it's not very functional. This little device that you can see here, which I've sort of blown up, is the brains of an operational ambulance. Now whether this is an ambulance that works in Australia, works in Canada or works in the USA, they all have some kind of computing motherboard that runs everything. And when I mean runs everything, it runs your sirens, it runs your lights, your communication, the works. Okay? 
So the incorporation of the ambulance brain with the actual switch that sits at the dashboard. So all those that um, have utilised ambulance before, you reach up and you hit your different switches for turning your sirens and lights and all that stuff on. We incorporated that as well. Now the incorporation of those two areas is what actually makes the functionality inside this particular module work. Okay, and without that we wouldn't have our lights, we wouldn't have our sirens, we wouldn't have our functioning oxygen, we wouldn't have our functioning alarms, nothing. Okay, so if the oxygen runs out in this particular unit, the alarm goes off, you have to switch through, change tanks, etc. Okay, fuses blow and the lights don't work, it functions the same way. Okay, so it operates the exact same thing. So if you have to problem solve something going wrong, you would problem solve that the same way you would in an actual real unit. From there, we then moved into the actual creation of the unit yourself, itself. Um, no, we didn't steal the, uh, the uh, badging and things from a parked ambulance at the hospital across the road. Uh, we actually did some uh, work with the Queensland Ambulance Service and they helped provide a, helped provided a lot of the interior and the external um, badging and things that you can actually see there. And without their help, um, there's no way we would have been able to get the, the reality um, that this unit actually has when you walk inside. So, as you can see on some of these photos, um, Gary, are those lights able to go off at all or does it make everything dark? Okay, fair enough. Um, what's a little bit hard to see because of the lighting, but um, as you can see there, you can have the, win the side windows, the forward view um, to actually sort of start to emulate um, what our actual realism is starting to look like. And this particular, that's just the stationary appearance of it. And then from there, that's what our actual module ended up looking like. So we've got our side panel access door, we've got our rear access door, and everything else functions like you actually have a real module. It is a little boxy, okay, this is our prototype, um, but the overall functionality of it works quite well. Um, other things we have done from a, from a space saving perspective and from a, a room perspective is underneath here we've actually incorporated um, storage and other avenues like that. So restocking and things like that. We've actually made drawers. Okay, it's just a picture of a wheel but we've, you pull that out we've got drawers and storage space and things like that. So it's a one stop shop. We've got other learning areas around us um, and that basically is our central hub for um, for restocking. We had a chance to actually wander through um, the MD ambulance uh, a few days ago and we, we looked at the areas where they uh, restock the ambulances then to shift. So basically what we've got set up underneath this unit serves as a purpose for our students so when they finish doing their training or their scenarios or things like that they go back in there and they know which drawers they go into to actually restock um, their ambulance or restock that ambulance. Um, for scenarios and training that we do externally to the module they actually have little trolleys. Um, and that little trolley emulates their ambulance. So at the end of each scenario, they restock their trolley or restock that ambulance via these particular methods. So basically what we've been able to do here is we've actually replicated a fully functioning working ambulance back part or module. Um, inside that, we've got the Striker Powerlift XPS. So for those of you who happened to be at the um, Chiefs Conference earlier this week, that was the uh, yellow Striker stretcher with the big um, bariatric sides that come off it. Um, we've got our striker stair chair, our cold pulse 3 defibrillator, full oxygen and suction working which is um, unlike some of the other modules that we've seen out there. So everything inside there works. You want to hook the oxygen up and you want to actually have someone on a nebulator, it functions the same way. Okay? You want to actually replicate bag masking or CPAP on someone, the oxygen actually works. Um, full communication, so the students are able to communicate via radios and via our, our tablet platforms that we're putting forward. Um, fully stocked cabinets and complement, full complement of paramedic equipment. So we've replicated this particular module on the ambulances that our students will do most of their placement at um, and that includes um, the stocking of the cabinetry as well. We recently had a Queensland Ambulance paramedic, um, he's a critical care high acuity response paramedic, uh, come in as one of our sessional lecturers and looking around absolutely every cabinet was exactly the same way so he could step into that ambulance and he could actually grab something out of the cabinetry the same way he would as if he was on a real job um, and that sort of blew his mind a little bit that we went to that much detail. So just want to make sure everyone's still awake because I know I am a boundary between you and morning tea and I don't want to hold you up too much in regards to that but this looking at that particular image um, where would you say that image was actually taken? A few hands in the air. Sorry? In the simulator, yep. 
that makes it a little bit easier because of the fact that we've just been talking about it. But if you, <laughs> so, so that, at least I've got some laughs, so at least you're awake. But what you can act, what the point I'm actually getting is the lighting makes it a little, the, the, the sunlight makes it a little bit trickier. But the way it's actually sitting, that when I first showed that to someone that had no idea what I was actually talking about, they asked me, they responded back with, why are you showing me a picture of someone in an ambulance? And they said, but I'm not. And I said, but yes, you are. So we had this two-way conversation for a few seconds about arguing about what the picture was. They were completely convinced that, because if you have a closer look at that, that that image actually was someone inside an ambulance. Now, the way that worked a little bit better, and this was completely unintentional, is when we actually did the filming for this, um, it actually picked up the sun stripes that go across the window. So for me, when I originally put the planning of this in place, I just assumed to have it set up so we'd capture things as they went past. But on all the um, Queensland ambulances, they've actually got stripes that go across the window and things like that. So it actually captured it like it was a real window as opposed to just a blank bit of glass. And that, those little minor technicality actually made it look more realistic. Um, and with the movement of cars and things that go past, um, because basically when you're sitting in it, you've got our big front window, which we'll see in a minute, um, the vehicle you see driving up beside you will then go past the window and out the back window behind you. And that's the bit that blows people's heads because at the moment, with it stationary, that's what's causing the motion sickness. Um, so that's the next challenge that we've got to try and see and we've got to try and fix so that they're not vomiting all over our simulated patients because it gets messy. This particular picture, um, where was that taken? Where? Anyone? Simulate, hands up for simulator. A few. Hands up for an actual ambulance. Okay, that was the actual ambulance we did the training in, okay? And in the simulator, you actually see this officer actually moving his hand, looking, talking on the communications and things like that. Okay, so basically, what, um, what I'm gonna show you now is about a sort of two minute video that shows how we actually put that together and actually brought it to life so it functions with students' involvement inside it. Now, um, hopefully this will play. Okay, so, I mean, as you can see, it's, um, it does start to capture um, the movement um, and the students were um, quite surprised just how realistic it actually was. We've run a few nurses and doctors through it as well in the same sense and, again, they were taken back by just how uh, realistic the movement, um, the sensory movement actually was um, and going from there. Now, before we finish off, when I talk about some of the other uh, challenges that uh, we've got coming up with us, um, the universities 
working for a university does have its pluses um, over working within a government organisation, so I've noticed over the past few years, is that the support and the technical um, expertise you can get within that university to help you achieve this type of thing is, is quite amazing. Um, they provided um, electrical engineers to help with the rewiring um, of the actual computer module itself because basically what we did was we took the internal workings of an actual ambulance, cables, tubing, the works, um, had some kind of a schematic diagram that the engineers looked at and went, yeah, that's great, but it makes no sense, I'll do it myself. Uh, and they put it back together in a very short period of time. Uh, they also produced, uh, gave us um, the expertise to actually build it from scratch. So instead of actually taking an, a module, which technically you could do from a decommissioned vehicle and actually replicate it in the same manner. We actually built this one from scratch. Um, the reason for that is so that we can actually trial the next phase, which will be the hydraulic implementation, so that we can take away some of that sensory overload of not working. Now, we're not going to stick it up so it moves around and functions in the same capacity of an airline simulator. However, the same methodology is what we will apply to it. So we will get it so that it emulates you going forward. So as the vehicle actually moves forward, with the momentum of the screens moving around you, you won't get as much of a sensory overload as you do when you're sitting there with things moving around you but you're not actually moving. And then the same as when you're trying to slow down, you'll get that same effect. So if the students are actually trying to do CPR, for example, they'll actually have to position themselves in the right period. Now, we emulated some CPR, which we didn't catch on video, un unfortunately, the other week. Um, and that student, without, without even being told how to do it, automatically looked at ways of trying to position themselves so they wouldn't fall over. Um, and that was quite, um, quite a bit of a light bulb moment for myself and some of the other lecturers that were there because they were actually able to comprehend, as opposed to just sitting there doing it on the carpet, um, being inside that vehicle, it was a slightly different technique. And they repositioned them in such a way to actually do it. So. Um, other things that we're looking at doing is being in this room actually is kind of cool because this room is a little bit bigger but will be about three quarters of the size of it for our actual next phase of our project which actually puts this in a dedicated simulation space. At the moment that's in a, uh, in a pilot room um, and we have enough space to get the stretcher out but that's about it. The next phase room um, is actually same size, three quarters of this size but it's not just going to be a room. The walls will actually be completely and utterly fully interactive. So instead of actually just having in a, in a, um, a white wall, white roof room, the walls actually will come alive from about eight to ten different projectors that are spread across the room. So depending on the scenario we're actually doing, that will actually change the surrounds around you. So as the students actually reverse this ambulance up to pull into the hospital, they'll see the hospital um, reversing up around the screens and on their back door and when they actually open the ambulance rear doors, the hospital emergency room entry point will actually be there in front of them and the, it'll be positioned in such a way so that they can just walk through the actual door to take their patient out. From there we'll have another room that's directly across from that that will be completely 360 degree projected room which could actually be turned into whatever you want. And for our purposes, we've got a lot of interprofessional learning we do with the medical students, physio students and nursing students. Our next phase actually would be to have that room set up so that they could then hand over to those students so they can then take on the simulation for themselves. Um, and we can ch ch replicate that room for whatever you want. There's another room I'm in the process of trying to gather funding for and support for, which is my aeromedical evacuation room. Um, I've showed a couple of um, examples of how that's going to work. Um, and that won't just involve the floor, the walls, it will involve the floors as well. So when that, when that aircraft takes off or, or leaves a particular scene, the entire floor will disappear just like you would in a helicopter or an aircraft. So I'm looking to see how many people grab on for something and when we actually implement that. We also do, um, uh, our medical school also does a lot of very immersive clinical um, engagement scenarios as well. And having our paramedic program now part of the School of Medicine our paramedic students will actually incorporate um, their part of that scenario. So instead of the medical students just being presented with um, X, Y, Z of a case, our paramedic students will actually do the pre-hospital care and treatment of that particular case and they will actually then hand it over across to the medical students who will then take on their particular care in hospital for that particular patient. 
and after the medical students handle it, it's then over to the nursing students who then look after the various ward care. And from there, it's over to the um, nutrition and dietetic students who then look after that particular student for their particular part and the physio students for their particular part. So we're incorporating a massive collection of um, immersive simulation that doesn't just affect one cohort of a university, but goes through various different people within that whole of healthcare approach. Um, and other technology that we're looking at implementing um, with this is um, our te telemetry with our patient care records, our ultrasound, our ECGs and things like that. So we're not just going to have it so that here's your patient, but we'll actually do it in a newer technology sense where we will transfer electronically through our intranet um, the patient care record of that particular simulated patient over to the medical students so they can see it as it arrives. Or we can emulate um, sending ECGs through for the, stu for the medical students to um, have a look to see what's coming or the ultrasound or things like that as part of a, um, a, a sit rep or a, a call to the hospital to say that we're inbound with XYZ patient. So really trying different ways to engage as, as much as possible. Um, and, and overall, um, we've, it's, it's something that's never been tried before well, within our area. Um, and in the small little pilot tree that we've had so far, it seems to be um, raising a fair, um, fair bit of success and people are quite surprised by just how um, engaging it actually changes the whole scenario in septic cough techniques. That's my contact details if you would uh, like to know more. Um, and I do want to thank you all for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Gary.